The first signs and traces of the Red Dead series go all the way back to 1985, when Capcom released Gunsmoke for the arcade. A decade and a half later, the designer of the game, Yoshiki Okamoto, would convince an American developer to make a 3D spiritual successor. The developer was Angel Studios, who before they became part of Nintendo's Ultra 64 Dream Team, were known for their 3D technology in all forms of media including music videos and film, but transitioned into video games after their partnership with Silicon Graphics and Nintendo, developing Mr. Bones, Ken Griffey Baseball and Midtown Madness in the process. And during that period, they were able to convince Capcom to make a game for them in 1997, the first non-Japanese developer to work directly with Capcom. Japan. Because of their technical pedigree, they were given the grueling task of porting Resident Evil 2 onto the Nintendo 64, compressing two PS1 discs onto one N64 cartridge. To give you an idea of how ridiculous that sounds, that's like porting Red Dead Redemption 2 onto the Xbox 360 with one HD DVD disc. Lots of compromises, but almost all the features still exist. Capcom was so impressed with the final result, they gave Angel Studios the opportunity to make their own IP. Development became began on the turn of the century and it wasn't even a western originally, no it was a tactical shooter where you controlled a SWAT team, similar to what the SWAT series coincidentally would end up doing in first person. Angel bounced between genres including one idea where it was set in one building at a carnival, but then Capcom Chief Operating Officer Yoshiki Okamoto, who was designer of Gunsmoke, wanted the studio to explore the western genre, originally calling it SWAT, Spaghetti Western Action Team. However, this was the moment when development hell began. Thanks to a lot of cultural and creative differences between American and Japanese staff, Angel Studios wanted a proper love letter to Western pop culture, while Capcom wanted a fantasy, colourful and insane spaghetti western, almost as if Mega Man travelled back in time. Both sides went on the same page, and it got to the point where the studio felt like they were working to Capcom's desires, not their intended vision and by early 2002, they had nothing to show for it. It was barely mentioned by Capcom, only being announced once, and Angel Studios weren't even sure if it was going to be released. It was a disaster, and just a year later, Capcom inevitably confirmed the cancellation of Red Dead Revolver. But secretly, Angel Studios, who are now called Rockstar San Diego, were still developing it, and without their hands tied. During the early 2000s, Angel also developed games for Rockstar, including Midnight Club Street Racing and Smuggler's Run, which were launch titles for the PlayStation 2, developing a healthy relationship together. By then, Rockstar had become juggernauts of the gaming industry, with the GTA series literally changing the way video gaming is perceived. But when the Hauser brothers found out about the Western project Angel Studios were working on, they were enthusiastic. Angel Studios had plans to put themselves up for sale, and Rockstar were on the top of their list. And after a little bit of tough negotiations, Angel Studios was acquired by Rockstar Games on November 2002, along with the rights to the Red Dead Revolver project, only on the condition that Capcom got to publish it in Japan if they ever finished it. And just a few months after Capcom cancelled Red Dead Revolver, Rockstar Games re-announced it on December 2003, and after a few altercations and missing pieces being filled. Finally, on May 2004, Red Dead Revolver was released for the PlayStation 2 and Xbox, and it's also available on the PlayStation Store if you have a PS4. Admittedly, I only ever heard of this game after playing Red Dead Redemption. Like I've said in previous reviews, I was highly out of touch when it came to gaming news even back then, and I don't recall seeing Red Dead Revolver on retail shelves when it was new. But I've been getting endless requests to review Red Dead Redemption 2, obviously. And before I do that, I want to go back to where it all began. It's important to know the history behind the series. Red Harlow, who lives happily with his family, is learning how to shoot scarecrows, pots and pans dead with a revolver, but then some bandits invade the house and kill his parents, with Red barely escaping injured and shooting the arm off the one leading the charge. It turns out his father Nate and his partner Griff found gold on Bear Mountain, and after Griff found himself in a life-threatening situation with the Mexican army during a battle, he sold Nate out, offering General Diego half the gold in exchange for sparing him, and Diego sent a colonel to kill Nate and his family, but Red was able to survive and escape. Years later, Red becomes a bounty hunter and is on a quest to avenge his parents, while Griff and General Diego do everything they can to stop him. A thousand pieces in gold? To the man who brings me that gringo's head. Ain't no shame in cheating death twice. 
As you can already tell from the cutscenes, Red Harlow might as well be nicknamed the man with no name. He looks like him, acts like him, and has similar intentions. How much for the lot? Well, you did good, son. While still with his family, he was a naive, loving person. But after the unfortunate happened, it affected him and won't let anything stand in his way. I just want my money. It's a shame Red didn't make an appearance in either of the follow-ups. He would have fitted in perfectly, and he's in the game's title. Fun fact, he's voiced by Robert Bogue. Buke, I don't know how to pronounce it. Who also did Troy in GTA The Battle of Gay Tony, and Steve Haynes in GTA 5. Red also runs into some allies along the way, including Jack Swift, Shadow Wolf, Annie Stokes, and Buffalo Soldier, who help drive the plot to the extent of revealing backstories, surprising moments, and unique gameplay moves, which I'll get to. However, there's no proper balance between the serious and the over-the-top, because it never stops going a million miles an hour, and it switches characters at a high rate, so it's easy to get too distracted. And playing it the first time, I didn't have a clue what was going on until the final half an hour. I needed a second playthrough. Fella such as yourself should know better than to stick his nose where it don't belong. But one aspect they did almost perfectly is the way it looks, at least for a PlayStation 2 and Xbox game. The Western themes are strong and there are more subtle references than you think. Along with the Warriors and Bully, it's another example of Rockstar's love for pop culture, which was at its most diverse in the mid 2000s. But my favorite thing about it is how it sounds, like the gunshots, or the soundtrack which uses songs from old spaghetti Western films, which means I can't demonstrate. But playing this game with that music in the background, it's brilliant and it looks especially sharp on the PlayStation 4. There is the occasional glitch, like here I just disappeared to the end of the train, that was weird. And there's still a little bit of Capcom's touches with the characters and level design. It's like the game is trying to escape from it, but Rockstar had little time to waste to completely overhaul everything. Either way, I love the overall atmosphere. Not bad, bounty hunter. Not bad at all. And because there's no electricity in this fictional world, the gameplay had to keep things exciting. And like I said before, it did so too well. But that doesn't mean it's also brilliant. When Rockstar Games took over from Capcom, the game was still unfinished. The only aspects that were left intact were visual based, including the characters and level design. But since both publishers are very different from each other, there was a lot that needed to be reworked. And to do so in a fraction of the time it took, compared to when it was under the direction of Capcom, is kind of impressive. But since Rockstar and its new San Diego subsidiary was on the same page, it makes sense. Unlike the Red Dead follow-ups that are set on a giant map that take an eternity to cover, the level designs vary between rooms, on-rail vehicles, and towns so tiny they can work as dollhouses. Each one looks different, but is as straightforward as it sounds. The closest you get to an open world is this place, Brimstone, where you can purchase weapons and random items, which even despite my research, I can't truly understand the purpose of. I know there's a description for each one, but I never see Red use them, at least compared to John Marston in Red Dead Redemption. Let me know in the comments section because I seriously don't know. It'd be worth a pretty penny to you. The weapons make more sense. They vary between damage, range, and after you use them in a level, they require repairs. Whenever you complete a level, you collect bounty for the kill, unlock new weapons, characters for showdowns, increased health, and special ability usage. You're ranked on accuracy, time, and highest combo, similar to what the GTA series would implement half a decade later. The better the performance, the more you unlock. I don't know what to make of the controls. Some aspects are fine, but others needed work. Shooting a gun feels good, especially with those sound effects. I was worried that holding the shoulder button almost non-stop would get cumbersome over time because it's the only way to fire your weapon, but it's not too bad. It also creates room for other moves which are easy to forget. However, the cover system is useless if most enemies charge straight at you like Doom, still better than nothing. The melee mechanics are pretty bad. You can never reach far enough to get a hit, and the only time it's worth using is in this bar fight. After you complete a combo, you're vulnerable for a second, and some moments where... Just look at the footage. Don't get me wrong, it's playable enough to beat it, and I really like this level where you have to reach the front of the train while shooting enemies, and avoiding obstacles at the same time. But it's obvious that the controls are clunky on certain areas. Away. 
Throughout the game, all of Red's allies become playable, and each one has their own special ability. Annie can fire explosive rounds with her rifle. Shadow Wolf can add fire to his arrows. But Red's move that has become a staple for the series is the Deadeye. You can enter slow motion, hit the fire button, and you'll automatically shoot at all marked areas at once. It works exactly the same as Red Dead Redemption, only you can't lock markers manually. It's especially effective in duels, which are another series staple. They play more of a major role compared to Red Dead Redemption, and are more complicated than the tutorials illustrate, at least until you reach the final few showdowns. It's probably because I started playing it properly when I was already 20 minutes through it, and forgot how it worked. But it seems like more than half the deaths were the results of failed duels, because I could never comprehend it, and when I won, I felt lucky. I can't tell if you're meant to mow them down, stay accurate quickly, or fire a certain number of bullets. You can't just do one perfect headshot, which is stupid. It's all trial and error. This game is actually pretty hard if you underestimate it, and this is coming from someone who thinks the GTA missions Demolition Man, Wrong Side of the Tracks and Supply Lines are easy. Some enemies can take more bullets than the Terminator, with headshots inflicting slightly more damage, and there's such a high volume of boss battles, you'd be forgiven for thinking Rockstar used a format similar to the Sega Mega Drive games developed by Treasure. I'm guessing there's more where they came from. And almost every time I beat a level, it's close. Like, really close. For example, look at this fight against the Grizzly and the health bars. I also ran out of arrows, resorting to throwing knives, and I did it. Yeah, it's also easy to lose all your ammo during levels, so be careful. It's all about finding their weaknesses. However, it does a poor job demonstrating where. I know they can't have a bright big target saying shoot here, but I guarantee you'll lose a life at least once on every chapter. Don't be at least you get infinite continues. The hardest part is defending Jack while he's trying to pick his way into the mansion. Can't you just use dynamite? You don't expect me to answer a stupid question like that. It also doesn't help that checkpoints are scarce, which is the most frustrating thing about Red Dead Revolver. It can get ridiculous sometimes, so you'll need a bit of thick skin to beat it the first time. Would have it been easier if the controls were better? Probably. To sum up Red Dead Revolver, it looks really nice and it has its exhilarating moments. But for me, this game is not as good as I was hoping. I mean, I wasn't expecting it to hold a candle to its follow-ups. It's not a bad game, but the controls and lack of checkpoints made it more annoying than fun. It's one of those games where I don't know if I recommend it or not. Just take what I said and decide for yourself. That being said, these two wouldn't have existed if not for Red Dead Revolver. I don't think the owner of the bank would approve. It was a huge step in the right direction for Rockstar despite the mixed reception. They had so much faith in the genre, they announced a follow-up just a year after release called Old West Project and the rest is history. It was another example of waiting for the technology to evolve to get the Red Dead game they've always wanted, with both examples showcasing what they can do. And Rockstar San Diego was in the thick of that evolution, developing the Rockstar Advanced Game Engine in 2005 that would power the publisher to this day. While not the best game made by Rockstar, Red Dead Revolver was released at a time when Rockstar San Diego was slowly setting their foot in as one of the publisher's most important subsidiaries, and kickstarted one of the most popular franchises today.